Hey everybody, welcome back to the Modern Customer Podcast. I'm your host, Blake Morgan. Today my guest is Professor Stefano Puntani. He is the Professor of Marketing at the Wharton School and Director of AI at Wharton. Prior to joining Penn, Stefano was a professor of marketing and head of department at the Rotterdam School of Management in the Netherlands. He holds a PhD in marketing from London Business School, and he has a degree in statistics and econ from the University of Padova. Um, He is originally from Italy. Today on the show, we're talking about AI and customer experience use cases and the latest research out of Wharton on AI. Please enjoy Stefano Puntani. Stefano, welcome to the Modern Customer Podcast. Are you in Philadelphia right now? I am in Philadelphia, indeed. Um, okay. In Center City, Philadelphia. In Philly. Is school in session right now? Uh, yeah, I'm not teaching this semester, so actually it's the one time of the year when I get to, uh, you know, engage in things like, you know, writing and uh, speaking, things like that, to be easier. Once I start teaching yeah. in January, it's going to be very busy. Yeah, my mom is a professor of art, and I'm I'm familiar. Just it's very busy. She's just constantly she, students are customers, and she is very busy with that. So, anyway, um, it's so nice to meet you. You know, you are here to talk about something that I get asked about a lot. I wish I had more knowledge on this subject, but it's still so new. A lot of people just they don't really know much about it. So let's just talk about your initial interest in AI and generative AI and, and how you kind of got started focusing on this. Yeah, I've been doing work on uh, um, AI and automation more generally um, in marketing for about a decade. And I come from it, not from the quant or technical perspective, I come more from the behavioral science perspective. So I'm originally a statistician who moved to decision science and consumer behavior research. And then basically, about 10 years ago, I saw this uh, incredible advances in machine learning starting to deliver a product that we were not thinking were even going to be possible, like uh, self-driving cars, a voice activated assistance. And so I started thinking about what this means for uh, um, consumer experiences, for, for you know, the marketing of products and services, for uh, you know, um, customer relationships, uh, for customer service, all of these topics, and uh, realized that there was a huge open question about a lot of these things. So I decided to start doing research in that area. It's been good. It's been really exciting. Lots of new research questions. Mm -hmm. Okay. Um, One of the research questions I get a lot is just about the state of business and and generative AI. Um, What do you see as some of the biggest impacts of generative AI to just the business world as a whole? Yeah, so this is a very new area, as uh, you're surely aware. And it's not something where... It's very easy to um, be definite about the uses a company are um, you know, going to find for uh, generative AI. This is something that is moving very fast. Uh, certain things, though, are already quite clear in terms of both the capabilities of the technology, but already the work that companies are doing in trying to deploy those uh, um, capabilities in specific use cases. So although I think it's still very early, uh, we can start at least painting some kind of picture of what generative AI is likely to um, to do in terms of impact and affecting workflows, especially when it comes to marketing and customer experience. And the uh, most recent data that I can share comes from a uh, really cool survey that uh, we conducted last summer in collaboration with uh, GBK Collective, a, uh, a very cool market research agency that I had the chance to work with. And uh, what we did was to basically design a survey and field it to uh, um, several hundred senior con- um, executives across large U.S. corporates and across industries, across uh, different functions, to try to understand what they think of generative AI, what they uh, feel even about it, what uh, use cases they see as the most promising and uh, uh, important, and also some questions about deployment. What do they, um, you know, what do they think they're going to do to to learn about this? And so, in terms of, for example, of actually use, we find that over fifty percent of the executives that we surveyed report um, already be using generative AI. So this is really surprising to me to the extent that the technology has been around in its most, let's say, 
accessible format only for about a year and uh, we already see a massive take up of the technology. It's difficult to imagine another productivity tool that uh, has uh, rolled out through, you know, that's been deployed through uh, um, society so fast actually. And um, so this is not a technology that is around the corner. No, this is not next year's technology. This is already happening today with, like I said, over 50% of respondents already using it. And then there's a lot of data on use cases. So we ask them, what do you think you're gonna do? Or maybe what are you already doing? And so we collected a long list of possible use cases and we did expect some variance into how often this would be mentioned by, by the respondents. And I was surprised by how high the numbers were. We found the least, the smallest amount of, uh, um, let's say, projected use cases for legal contracts that seem to be, uh, maybe there are some issues concern, uh, you know, concern around compliance or maybe, you know, so-called hallucination that, you know, AI can make mistakes. Uh, but st that's still pretty high. And if you go to other um, use cases that we collected, they are pretty much all in the 80s and even high 80s, meaning um, over 80% of respondents said that they are doing it already or they plan to do it within three to five years. And um, that basically means almost everybody. And so it's pretty, pretty widespread. And uh, um, if you want, we can talk a little bit about uh, which use cases in particular, but uh, many of them are related to marketing. Yeah, I mean, the question I get asked that I feel like people are frustrated with, it's like, but what does it look like? Like, what does it mean? What is a use case? Like, give me something I can get my arms oh. around because this is just too general. So if you could be specific, that would be wonderful. Mm -hmm. Yeah, so the, um, let me go through, I can make a list of use cases that have been very much endorsed by our survey, so we can, uh, we can see what these are. Yeah. Um, you know, the, the one that had the highest level of endorsement was data analysis, and these will be situations where you have a data set, and uh, for example, it might come from a market research um, agency, that's some data that you collected, it might be something you collected yourself as part of your processes, maybe these are visitors to your website, maybe there are some product, product related features or some website features, like uh, how many people logged in uh, into the platform, what did they do, and you know, whatever it is. What you have now, an opportunity to use a tool like the ChatGPT with the advanced an um, analysis uh, plugin, where you can really get a lot done and you can feed the algorithm, an Excel file, for example, the algorithm understand what's in there. You, you can tell them what you want using natural language. So you can say, make me a bar chart showing how these two types of customers stack up against this metric. And then it will produce a very nice bar chart. And if you want to then change it, you just ask them to refine it and make it this and make it that, and then it'll do it. And uh, this will greatly simplify things like reporting, uh, creation of dashboards, um, and generally the uh, process of managing data. Um, you know, not so much the collection of the data, although there is a role to be played there as well, but more the, um, you know, managing of the data. Um, another use case that was very well endorsed was marketing content. You can imagine that a lot of, uh, you know, work in marketing goes into creating content, whether that is, you know, websites, product related, uh, um, you know, uh, materials or reports, uh, whether that is, you know, yeah, writing, basically or content writing, and content writing, social media posts, yeah. email marketing, whatever, you know, and yeah. all of that basically can be done, um, you know, to a large extent by, um, by relying on generative AI to a large extent. But the cool thing about it, it's not that it's going to make it cheaper. I think in many situations it's going to make it better. So for example, people say we are going to personalize, say our email campaigns, but in reality, the level of personalization that you see oftentimes is pretty shallow. It might be, you know, as, as limited as adding your first name at the beginning of the email and then customizing two or three elements to it, depending on what you're subscribing or what you're buying. Um, but uh, there could be so much more that can be done. So with generative AI, you could actually create a truly personalized email that reflects the interaction that you've had with the customer and the way that you think the customer is interacting with your products. Um, so that I think has the potential, not just as slashing cost, but also making the interaction a lot better. Yeah, I mean, a lot yeah, of marketers are using it um, in content teams. And I even was in the Philippines and the CMO was saying they're now using it for all their content and marketing campaigns. What about on the customer side, Stefano? What are you seeing like from customer service? Like how could you imagine customer service being made more efficient? So customer service will be impacted by generative AI in many ways. So 
you already have had that wave coming already for, uh, for a while now, where you see increasingly companies deploying chatbots to offer a first line of customer service. You know, almost any website you go to nowadays is only a chatbot popping up saying, do you need anything? So that's one. Um, but I think more exciting would be to think about how to augment um, customer representative um, skills in the in a more involved process. So I remember talking to a um, we, we I had a, a meeting with a, a leading Dutch company. They were thinking about deploying AI in um, in customer service, and their first implementation, and this is already several years back, was to have an automated system that would take a query from a customer and this would come from either a company-owned channel or uh, you know social media channels or WhatsApp or whatever it is and this query would come in and um, the, uh, the AI would uh, interpret, try to read the message and then understand what would be an appropriate response and serve that to customer representatives. So the response wouldn't go out immediately or automatically. It would go to the customer representative who would take that query, look at it, make an assessment as to the accuracy of that information. And this was in the travel industry, so it would be something like, you know, to complain about uh, uh, this element of the experience, go on this link and file this form, or to request a, a refund for this, go here, or whatever. And so that kind of information could be pulled out by from the website by the bot, uh, you know, you know, in just milliseconds and save time to the customer app. Um, but then the interesting thing here was that the company was concerned that the customer reps would be opposing this innovation because they saw, saw it or potentially they'll see this as replacing their right. job and they'll probably be you know, unhappy that now part of the job is being automated. And to their surprise, they discovered that in fact the customer reps welcomed that uh, um, that innovation for a number of reasons. One was that the company was being swamped with requests, so they had a hard time processing all of it. And so customer reps were under a lot of pressure to uh, turn these calls around very fast, which made it both stressful and also very repetitive. And um, what the bot did was to allow them to some almost change the nature of the, nature of the job. Before, the job was, what do they want, here's what do they need, put it in a message, send it back. And now, what they needed was already basically in the template, almost always correct. And the customer rep could use the short time allotted to that uh, interaction to say something meaningful. This would be maybe adding an emoji or adding an empathic message, you know, to sympathize with the customer experience when something went wrong or to, see, you know, to, to maybe add some hope or some uh, some care basically made the job more meaningful so now it's not just about pulling that information and sending them the url where they can complain but all of a sudden becomes something a little bit more uh, you know personal and meaningful you know for what the let me right. stop you there though you know what's so funny is stefano as a customer haven't you had this happen to you where the agent will say i think i called t-mobile this week where they said it's just so exciting that you're calling us. And I just thought like, really, is it that like, I've been 40 minutes trying to figure out if I can get my daughter a smartwatch. It was just like the wrong sentence. I'm like, I'm not excited to be calling you to sit here for 40 minutes. So I, I like that. But I feel like these, yeah, some people are just they, like- they are so excited. They're so excited to talk to you, but they kept you 45 minutes on the line and before they- I'm so them. excited to talk to you, Blake. And then there's the, the pause before my name because they're like, who, who is this? Anyway, but I hear what you're saying about the generative AI for agents. Is, is there anything else that's helping with efficiencies inside a customer service environment that you could imagine? Um, AI has been used to improve the efficiency of business processes already for a long time, so over a decade now. And... Um, and so there's a lot of back-end operations that can be optimized and made more efficient by, by AI, by learning algorithms that can make good predictions about anything, for example. For customer service, the best thing you have in customer service is that you don't need it, meaning your job you know, is done well such that people don't have to call you and complain or they don't know how to figure something out. So AI can help to shrink the uh, amount of requests that come in by simply making better predictions about what the customer needs are and where the service might go 
or eyes so that we can actually you know prevent those calls from coming in in the first place i think that would be ideal right so obviously we all need all, every company needs customer service but the reason why you know you know blake you're calling t-mobile not just to have a chat right you call t-mobile because you've got a problem to solve and so it wouldn't be better if you didn't need to call them at all because the problem wasn't there in the first place i think ai is part of a very important suite of new technologies including you know, uh, robotics and sensor technology and other types of uh, digital tools that can help companies just making sure that uh, the customer experience is the best it can be. And when that is the case, then a customer service becomes you know, maybe something that you, you know, ideally is even obsolete. I mean, you don't need customer service because we're perfect. Of course, this is never gonna, never gonna happen, yeah. but, uh, but the ideal would be to, to make sure the operations run so well that we don't run into a lot of trouble. Let me ask you about what you talked about earlier about data. It seems every company today is predicting for 2024, like every analytic analyst firm is saying that, that for 2024, the big trend is insights. So we have data, but we can't use the insights right now. So next year it's about getting more smart and accurate and being able to trust the data. Do you think machine learning and AI will help us with that? Yeah, yes and no. I don't think the problem is necessarily trusting the data because that suggests really that the problem with uh, making insights from data, it's the quality of the data. And I think the problem is a different one and to some extent much bigger and much more fundamental, which is what data do we need to solve the problems that we have? When you see many companies, they basically obsessing over data um, almost for the sake of it. So we want to have data lakes and maybe data oceans or whatever. We want to have more data and then we store the data. And now we have to handle the data and then hopefully we get something useful from it. But sometimes it's almost like an article of faith that we should be able to do that. But you know, you're gonna get useful insight from data only when analytics are serving important business decisions. So the question is not, you know, what do I do with the data I have? The right question to ask is, do I have the data I need? And that is the answer to that question is often no. You actually don't have the data you need to make the decision you need to make. So we argue that actually many companies have got it upside down. It shouldn't be that their decision making is data driven. Rather, what we argue is that their data analytics should be decision driven. You know, it should be going the other way. You shouldn't be looking at the data and do something with it. It should be trying to do something and figure out what data you need. And uh, so that angle focusing more on the decision and the impact that we can make in business, I think is gonna change a lot of the ways that uh, managers and companies are looking at data and say, actually, yeah, big data is great, but it's better to have good data, you know, rather than big yeah. data. This is the data we need. That's basically the question. And I think AI can maybe help streamlining some processes, but it's really not a tech question. This is a very fundamental decision-making question. And say what it is that we can do tomorrow, what decisions we can take in the company tomorrow to make business better, and then figure out what are the options that we can pursue in, you know, in our attempt to satisfy those business objectives. And then you want to rank those options, and for that you need data. And so what data do I need to know if option A is better than option B? Well, this is the data you need, then send the analyst to get it. And maybe you have that data already, and maybe you don't. But I think the, the right process starts from the decision and works itself backward towards the data rather than obsessing over the data and then trying to extract some value from it. Stefano, one of the biggest challenges that my audience have is customer feedback and understanding customer behavior. So obviously as a customer, you've probably gotten a survey. How likely are you to recommend us to a friend and why or why not? And then, you know, companies are tasked with plowing through all of this feedback and figuring out, are they doing a good job? Or are they not? What can they do better? Um, what is the role of AI in plowing through what we call structured and unstructured feedback. So feedback that customers are giving us, but also we can see the customer, we can see what they're doing. So we have yeah. that data as well. What is the what is the role of AI to get more helpful with that? So AI is a tool that enables you to make good predictions, right? So it's not necessarily telling you why something happened, but it can tell you what is happening. So um, you can use AI to uh, make sense of um, unstructured data. For example, you may have a pile of customer reviews and you want to extract some kind of sentiment from it. You want to understand what is going wrong and why. For that, you can automate 
um, the analysis using um, natural language processing and basically customer sentiment analysis tools. These have been around already for a while. They're getting better, obviously, with time, but they're already very good. But this is not the generative part. The generative part will be more the creation of content. So you could imagine having, for example, a generative AI tool, which is, uh, um, you know, used for, for example, a number of different, you know, useful and in the uh, you know uh, customer management process, one could be: Can you summarize all these materials? What is it in here? So basically, have some kind of a filter mechanism that enable you to make sense in a way that is, you know, maybe more free flowing, more free form than just a numerical number like a customer sentiment uh, score. The second one could be, and this is a little out there. I don't think we are quite there yet to do it, but I can see this happening, where you can use generative AI almost like a synthetic customer. And so provided you have enough data about uh, your category and the way that your customers feel about the category, you might be able to use generative AI tools to essentially create personas that you can interview, essentially. Imagine feeding a lot of data about your customers to a large language model and then create a profile that you prompt the AI with. You are this person experiencing this problem. And then you can interview this person not a real person, obviously, it's just an algorithm making up something, but uh, provided there's enough data in the training um, uh, data set provided to the algorithm that is relevant to the conversation you're having, I've seen some first test of this basic idea and it can be quite powerful. What does it look like? You've seen it. What is, uh, is it a Frankenstein? So there are companies that are working in this space. Um, I had uh, um, an interview with a startup, for example, that was showing me how you could uh, interview synthetic customers to gain some insight into you know, product bottlenecks uh, or issues that uh, your customers may experience or about what kind of benefits they're seeking and why they're seeking those benefits or what do they perceive as barriers to adoption? What are the things that limit people's interest in a product? All of that could be explored you know, within limits. I mean, I mean, there's a lot of caveats and I think you, know, you, you, you can't maybe over uh, emphasize this, but I think it's a very interesting, almost crazy to me kind of dimension where you can now have customer research, which is in fact taking place without having to ask any customer. <laughs> it's kind of a bizarre idea and it won't work for everything and for many things it might work really badly, but it will work for certain things to the extent that it might provide a very interesting you know, complement to traditional market research and customer research. Would an example of that, Stefano, be how does a customer move through a buyer journey? Like where are the gaps? For example, yeah, you could imagine customer journey type research done with uh, at least to be supported by uh, large language models. And it doesn't have to replace it. Obviously, this is not going to replace the entire market research process, but it could provide A, some preliminary insights that you can then test and validate with real consumer data. Or in some situations where currently you're simply unable to get customer data because either you don't have the money or you don't have the time, you might get something. And maybe it's not perfect, but it might be still better than nothing. So uh, there are uses that people will find for this kind of technology. And I think it's pretty cool. I think we live in interesting times with something. We're even going to have this kind of conversation. Yeah. yeah, I mean, many predictors are now saying that they believe there'll be a fully automated contact center in like the next five to 10 years. Um, it's interesting for an industry that treats customers generally speaking so poorly and puts clunky technology in between themselves and their customers. I, are you optimistic that this AI will fix an industry that is very broken in many cases? Well, I mean, there are a number of answers you can give to that. One answer a little bit in line with your spirit or your, the sentiment of your question is, well, you know, it's not like we're doing often a great job now. So <laughs> let's see what we no. can do using this technology. Maybe we can do better. And I do think the technology is bound to get better quickly as it has been for the past 24 months or more. And if this kind of rates of improvements continue for a similar amount of time, we stand to be in a situation where you oftentimes will have bots overperforming, outperforming human sales reps or customer reps by quite a significant margin and potentially even outperforming some of the best performers. And so uh, at that point, actually, it might be that the deployment of this kind of technology is not just a way of saving money, but it becomes a way of serving better the customer. You know, these bots 
are available 24 7 they never get tired they're never in a bad mood you know they uh, there's a lot going for them if they can you know access information provide uh, you know uh, reliable information have the right tone that doesn't you know uh, annoy customers you know the problem with a lot of chatbots we've had so far they just don't understand anything you try to get them to do something unless your query is the simplest query possible which by that time if that's the case probably you don't need a bot in the first place then uh, they fail and then over, oftentimes you struggle to actually get to talk to a person uh, but you know that won't be the case forever at the same time you can have a different kind of view and say well you know be careful if you are seeing technology just as a way of making your customer service cheaper rather than actually satisfying your customers and serve them better, then the danger is that uh, you are even going to further undermine uh, your customer relationships by deploying technology. So the problem is a little bit also, what's your motivation in doing this? Are you actually motivated by customer affinity and understanding of the customer and thinking, can we benefit from this technology so that we can do things faster and better? And you know, hopefully cheaper too. Or are you purely driven by the shiny, you know, attractive opportunity of saving a few bucks by deploying this? And then, uh, you know, you may opt for disappointment. Yeah, that's a good point. I think that's really important. I think everybody listening, you can think about that for your own teams. Like, what kind of culture do you have? And I think that's a wonderful note to wrap on. But let's do some rapid fire before we let you go, Stefano. Does that sound good? Sounds good. Okay, rapid fire. So these are quick answers to my quick questions. First question, what is the most important part of your morning routine? A bowl of yogurt with the raw honey and blueberries. Okay, what do you do to relax at the end of a hectic day? I run. Oh, I love that. Me too. Okay. What show are you watching on Netflix right now? Or Hulu or I... I actually um, just finished a Swedish uh, um, TV series that I really enjoyed. And my, uh, for those of you who have a Netflix account, I would very strongly advise to explore a foreign language TV series. Netflix has been incredible at producing content across the world. And there's so much great stuff out there that you can enjoy. Okay, very cool. What's your idea of perfect happiness? Um, learning. I enjoy learning, so when sometimes I read something and I have an aha moment, I feel great. And mm -hmm. otherwise, of course, spending time with my kids and my wife. Okay, what is one mental health strategy for managing hard days? You know, we underplay, underestimate the importance of breathing. If you're mm -hmm. breathing well, I mean, we're all breathing, obviously, <laughs> otherwise you're not alive. But uh, many of us are very bad at breathing, actually. And I think with uh, not much, uh, um, just a little bit of, uh, um, m you know, mindfulness, you actually might be able to breathe much better. And I find it has quite a dramatic effect uh, on my um, anxiety, on my mood, and on my ability to concentrate. Okay. What is your favorite type of vacation? Museums and food. <laughs> okay. If you could have lunch with anyone dead or alive, who would it be? Right now, I'd love to have lunch with Sam Altman, actually. Oh, yeah, sure. Um, lastly, if you had to describe your outlook in one quick motto, what would it be? Okay, this is a weird one. Um, the key to a happy life is lowering your expectation. That is so wise. Wonderful. And if people want to learn more about you and your research, where is the best place to do that? It would be great if you check out what we do at Wharton in the era of AI. It's an easy link to remember, ai.wharton.upenn.edu. And we have a great portal with lots of resources for anyone interested in learning about the impact of AI in business, including a 10-part series podcast and a lot more. Well, this has been really, really interesting and insightful. Thanks for being here, Stefano. I hope you'll come back next year and tell us more of your research and what you've learned. Thanks, Blake. Well, maybe it will be automated. It will be you know, a generative AI tool instead. <laughs> Hmm, interesting. I think it would be harder to automate you than for me. You could easily automate <laughs> me. <laughs> no, I'm kidding. Um, all right, Stefano, well, thanks for being here. All of you have been tuning into the Modern Customer Podcast. Until next time. Thanks for watching. Don't forget to subscribe to my YouTube channel and follow me on social media, including LinkedIn, Instagram, and X.